Good afternoon. I'm so happy to see all of you today. I'm Regina Brown. I'm a realtor here in San Antonio. I am a host, the host of Realty Success Hub. So super excited to have everybody on today. We've got Angela Brown. We've got Brooke Bryant and Aaron Brown. So we've got a fun show lined up for you today and we're ready to rock and roll. Hello. We've also got a, a guest on today, Betsy. Betsy, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Well, We're so excited to have you. Two of us. <laughs> yes. So I think our topic today is staging, if I'm not incorrect. Yes. It is. Yes. Well, and the exciting thing is I recently staged my own home for sale at the height of the market last summer. So not only did I get to um, sort of see the fruits of my labor in terms of the amount that we made, but also practice what I preach. I'm telling people every day how to optimize their home, either for their own personal living, if they're going to stay there, or to get maximum value if they're selling. And I got to see firsthand by making um, over a third, well, we bought it for a million. We sold it for 1.5. Nice. Wow. That's great. Like, yeah. That's great. And what area are you? What part so of the country? So we're right outside New York City in Westchester. That's okay. where the home was that I just staged. 2,300 square feet on 0.13 acres. So if you can only imagine, that's like, <laughs> we watched our neighbors make dinner. They watched me watch bad reality shows. So very <laughs> tight quarters, but we could see Manhattan from our primary bedroom. So there's nice. trade-offs. Right. Yeah. 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 Location, um, location, location. That's right. But we sold that and uh, we used staging tips uh, to get it done quickly. We sold uh, in two weekends and to earn more than than we thought possible. That's fantastic. Yes. Staging can be so beneficial. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and how you got into interior design? Yeah, so the company is, uh, well, it's Uploft Interior Design is the company. We have a podcast called Affordable Interior Design because everything we do at Uploft Interior Design is retail, is for clients with any budget. We don't mark anything up. We offer just flat rate design plans. So, you know, we'll completely adapt to how much they have to spend without adding any premium for us to be finding the items for them. So that's really different than most interior designers who make a margin on the things that they're recommending for their clients. So anyway, we have sort of a different model and, you know, some people can't even afford to hire us. So that's why I started the podcast to give free advice to people because I believe interior design is a right, not a privilege. Everyone should live in a space that feels comfortable, whether they have to shop at thrift stores and Target or whether they could afford room and board and crate and barrel. You know, they deserve to be empowered when they're shopping to have tips and tricks that will lead to the best possible outcome uh, in terms of, you know, having a cozy home that they feel proud of. So many people feel ashamed of their home. I'm sure you guys hear that all the time, especially cleaning, yes. right? That's another aspect where people can feel um, ashamed or not equipped with the right information or tools, but it's really easy to share and easy to do once they have that information. So that's how I feel about interior design. And that's ultimately how I feel about staging. Staging is a small part of what we do because we're mostly interior designers for people who are going to stay and enjoy the space. But the thing I love about staging is you can see that quick turnaround. You can literally see the payoff, right, with the value that they get with the um, sort of bidding wars that can happen when you do it properly. Right. Absolutely. And a big part, I think, for st I like to work mostly with buyers. And so when we go into a staged home, it can give them a sense of what this home can feel like and gives them an idea to, it's a clean slate for them moving into the home, but they need some ideas of what they can do to make that home feel like it's theirs. And there's, like you said, a home that they could be proud of and feel comfortable in and enjoy. It's their biggest investment. And it's so important for people to be able to enjoy that space and be able to envision that space when they're out looking at home. So it's it's really, really a great tool for buyers and for sellers. 
Exactly. And just like in business, you know, I have a business avatar. I don't know if you guys have heard of avatars uh, outside of video games, but a business avatar, which means, you know, this ideal client who, even though we work with all types of clients, when I'm creating marketing materials, when I'm creating the images I want to put on my website, I'm thinking about only one client. And the same thing I tell my people when they're selling their space is who is that buyer going to be? right? It, we all know or have a sense of who's going to be most attracted to our property based on our location. We were right outside New York City in the suburbs. It's going to be a busy family, probably with two kids, probably, you know, a lifestyle where they're commuting all the time. They need ease and convenience, but they can afford a million dollar home or 1.5 ultimately. So they like little luxuries. So I transferred out all my soaps, my hand soaps, even though we typically use hand soap from Target and just the pump. I went to William Sonoma, got William Sonoma hand soap. I wanted them to see an elevated lifestyle, right? They're moving from the city and they can keep that sense of luxury and sophistication even in the burbs. So I wanted to have fresh flowers and I wanted to create vignettes in different areas. Like the bathroom was a perfect opportunity to kind of make a little spa vignette with a sea sponge, with a fresh soap, with fresh succulents on the sink. So they could really imagine, you know, I could be here in a tub soaking the day's stresses away, you know, creating these little moments that are almost like a story. Mm -hmm. On the patio, I prepped it as if I was going to entertain, right? There was a pitcher out there. It was empty. There were glasses. There was a bottle of sparkling wine, you know, just getting it ready for the life that they would want. Those are great tips. And, and they're so affordable. A lot of people think that staging a home has to be this really big expense, and it really doesn't. Well, they say you should spend 1% to 5% of the sale price of your home on getting your home ready. So we painted our exterior for $11,000. And then the other $4,000 I put into buying things, doing landscaping, just getting everything looking perfect. And the first thing, which was a big part of the budget, is get rid of half of everything in your house. And it doesn't mean you're going to throw it out or whatever. You're going to put it in storage. But it was such a heavy lift, no pun intended because I really put half of everything we own into a storage unit. And then I hired a deep cleaner to make everything sparkling. And then I pretended to be very organized. I'm not super organized. <laughs> I'm a creative. I'm a creative, so things get a little messy. I don't have a magical bin for everything. I'm not an organizer. I'm an interior designer, different skill set. But I pretended I was an organizer bought bins with labels. Everything I did keep in the house was in very specific places with adorable little labels. Uh, I even went so far as to stage the fridge. So, you know, my family's eating stuff from Trader Joe's. My family has leftovers and takeout from the local Chinese place. All of that had to go. So we had Pellegrinos in there. I don't drink Pellegrino, right? We had Avion. I had organic fruit. I had those little clear containers, right, you know, that you see on TV shows like the home edit that had fruits and vegetables. Like, that's not my life, but that's <laughs> the life. You're creating a, a yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. I'm appealing to the premium buyer and helping mm -hmm. them to envision an elevated lifestyle and also helping them to envision the fact that this was owned by somebody with elevated taste. And now we're just passing the torch. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. Um, there's a reality side to things and what you're, you're speaking on sounds phenomenal. Um, I had a client fly in from Washington this morning and I drove an hour up to an amazing luxury part of town to the hill country. And we walked through this home. She flew in to put an offer in on this home and it, the exact opposite of what you're talking about had been done and what an impact it made in a really derogatory way. Mm -hmm. And if just half of the things you're talking about had been implemented, what a world of difference it would have made. Um, and I could give you a list of things, but even just half would have made such a difference. Just the little details, it makes them feel. And they had taken care of all of the large ticket items. The outside had been taken care of. Mm. 
but just the cleanliness of the interior of the home, the grout in the bathtub, the, you know, on the sink, just all of the little details, the refrigerator, those things that you're bringing up, they do make a difference. So people might think that you don't need to worry about it, but when you open a refrigerator and right. there's stuff filled inside of it, most mm -hmm. people think, oh, somebody walking through the house isn't going to look inside the refrigerator. But psychologically, it makes them feel like things are not maintained and they're not clean and they're not orderly. And what are they not seeing? And so oh, she, she left with a really poor taste in her mouth, not knowing if they want to put an offer in or not. And I, I want to jump in real fast, uh, Regina, and thank you for bringing that up because from the cleaner's side, and for those of you that don't know, um, I've been in the cleaning industry for now 32 years. And in fact, um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't self-promote. I'm going to really fast. I just came out with a new book called The Ultimate Guide to Move In, Move Out Cleaning. And this mm -hmm. is the homeowner's edition. Okay. This is for homeowners that are getting ready to sell your house. You can find it on all the places that you buy books, Amazon, whatever. But um, the, the purpose of it is, and it's full of checklists. Please go through every room of that house because yeah. there are a lot of things that you are, I'm going to call them your, your clutter blind or your house blind. You do not see those things like Regina said with the grout. And so because you're taking a shower every day or because you're in your bathroom every day and you do not see it, it doesn't exist wrong. That's not the right answer. People do see it when they walk in, just exactly like Regina said, if it's not maintained, they're thinking, oh, if this, which is so obvious and it's so right out in my face is not maintained, what else? And so like what Betsy was saying, if you're creating an entire lifestyle and you're trying to bring someone into that lifestyle, you got to make it so welcoming that when they walk in, they don't notice the grout. We don't want them to even notice it. If they don't mm -hmm. notice it, what they're looking at is they're looking at those fancy soaps and the succulents going, yes. oh, I could see myself in this space, right? If and you walk in and you see the grout, I have not done my job, right? Yeah, that's a great point. And it's, it, it's such a larger deal to them. So when we were going through the list of things that weren't going to work for her in the home, she's like, well, the bathtub, the showers, they need to be completely ripped out and replaced. And I was sitting there thinking, you get a house cleaner in here <laughs> to, to clean the grout and you're going to be fine. There were no cracks there. It wasn't, it wasn't even old. Um, but it's the details. Huge. Yeah. Difference. Yeah. Nothing is sacred when you're selling your home and when there's an open house. Imagine that everything will be opened, even your junk drawer. Yep. Everything will be seen. Your medicine cabinet, right? Your freezer, that closet in the basement. Everything's going to be exposed. So get half of it out there and the other half that you leave needs to be tidy, needs to be ideally organized in some fashion. And I'm sure people are thinking, just as I was thinking, frankly, this is so overwhelming. This is a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. And I took off work for a week and a half and just focused on this. Now it paid me dividends, right? Later. But yep. if you can't afford to do that, use that one to 5% of your sale price and hire a stager. Hire a home organizer, mm -hmm. hire somebody to move out your stuff. I'm a little bit of a micromanager. And plus I had vision, right? Because I'm an interior designer. I went to home goods for two hours. I spent $500 and, you know, I added all new sheets and all new bedding, all new towels. I mean, I had pristine towels, but they'd been washed for, you know, a year and they need to look crisp and perfect. It literally cost me $20 to buy a towel set for each bathroom. And it looked so beautiful and was just ready to go and set that scene. So I even thought myself, you know, I have beautiful throw pillows. I'm a freaking interior designer. There's no dearth of throw pillows in my life. And my real estate agent was like, hmm, those don't look as plumped as they could. And I was like, well, we've only had them for a few months. My kids had been throwing them around. You know, there's nothing like new crisp and new. Right. So I just went to home goods and I bought crisp new pillows in the exact same colors, practically the exact same texture. It actually hurt my heart to buy the same pillow, but um, it just made all the difference. Well, and all of the things you're saying are going to benefit you moving into your new home as well. When you take half of the things out of your home, like you mentioned, you're going to be packing and moving anyway. 
So Mm -hmm. you're that much ahead of the game. When you move into the new home, you're going to have beautiful new towels and pillows and you're just one more addition to that fresh start that you're making. So there are things that are going to benefit you moving forward. But so, I actually really thought of it as sunk cost. I must say, I mean, the the moving, the packing half was not sunk cost, but I tailor purchased these things only for this space. I thought of it as an investment in this space. So I bought what was perfect for these people who are obviously not me, as I've shared, right? My avatar was not me. Uh, I bought what was perfect for these people and what would really make this space pop. For instance, I bought a couple of mirrors. I didn't want these mirrors. I didn't even have a new house yet, so I didn't know where I was going to put these mirrors. But I knew that mirrors would augment the light in my dark hallway. I knew that they would sort of add depth to the end of my dining room, which is somewhat shallow. And so I bought things I knew I'd never use again or wasn't sure I would. And I think that people have to be willing to do that, to buy the right thing for this space rather than saying, oh my gosh, I'll never use this again. I just can't pull the trigger on that $80 mirror. A quick question on that, um, because I know a lot of people are on a budget and I know that you mentioned using, it was at one and a half percent of the sale price of the house. One to 5%. One to 5%. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. Is it possible, and maybe um, this is a cheapskate coming out in me, but is it possible that you could leave the tag on the back of the $80 mirror and then take it back to the store after the set, the home has sold. Cause obviously you're not going to leave all that stuff behind. Right. Or do you. Angela, I'm not going to fess up to anything right here, right now, but I think. Uh, okay. but the, it, is that, is that looked down upon? Is that wrong? I mean, if it's within a return window and nobody's ever actually like touched it and it's, it hasn't been used and it was just like a mirror and somebody looked in it as they walked through the house. And then like the week later you took it back to the store. Is it, is that, is that a doable thing or is that like not cool? I am not a home goods representative because I think from their point of view, if I was just putting on that hat, they would look down on it. Uh, as an interior designer, um, as a person who was, you know, trying to save every penny to buy that next place, which okay, I didn't stop talking. Like. I think I got the drift. We won't, <laughs> we won't leave we the down. Down. Our galleys. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Okay. Um, but I did keep some of it. I still have that decadent bedding. It's so great. But the towel set, I didn't return the towel set, but um, the towel set specifically went with that wallpaper in that bathroom. That was a sunk cost. Oh, wow. I'm not going to use bright yellow towels anywhere else. It's interesting Uh, you brought that up because we we did our own home decorating and it was, I don't know, one day I thought I was going to be an interior designer and that it lasted all of one house. But we had this amazing shower curtain and it was a handmade shower curtain that started at the top and it went all the way down to the floor. And it was like a really lavish thing and it matched the tile and the tub and it matched the 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 little rug that we had in the bathroom. And when we moved out, it only made sense to leave it because you're never going to find something that matched this perfectly with this bathroom. And the bathroom was set up in such a way that you would have to redo the whole entire bathroom if you were going to redo it. So we were like, it is as is. And we just sold it as is. So, but I do, I do miss that shower curtain because it was really awesome. (laughs) You you mentioned that you painted your home. Do you have any advice for home sellers on paint colors? Well, I painted not only outside, I painted the exterior, I painted the shutters, but I also painted inside, even though my paint was relatively pristine and I just moved in six years earlier. So I'd totally painted it when I moved in as an interior designer. I wanted to make my own choices. Surprise, surprise. Uh, And I did make some bold choices uh, because... I'm not afraid of color. So while the main part of the house was neutral, you know, two of the bedrooms were different shades of blue. One of the bedrooms was yellow. I had a green room. Like I really have a flair, guys. Uh, And instead of doing everything neutral or certainly white, which I am totally against, oh my gosh, especially because as soon as I sold my home, I went on to buy a home, right? And I'd been looking for a year and a half. And if I saw one more stark white home, white outside, white inside. First of all, it's super trendy, that modern farmhouse dark white look. Mm, But second of all, um, it betrays every flaw. I mean, nobody looks good just wearing a plain white sheet and either does your house. 
Uh, so I really think a neutral is nice, whether it's kind of a creamy beige, a gray beige. Uh, grays are somewhat out right now. People are looking for that warmer palette. But I did not change the colors, the bright colors in those rooms. What I did do was touch up the paint. Anywhere there were imperfections, you know, when I took down a lot of the personalized wall art, the family pictures all went into storage. Uh, then I patched those holes and painted. And sometimes that meant, you know, that the little patch areas didn't quite match the rest due to sunlight fading and things like that. So I had to paint the whole swath of wall. But painting, as one of my stager friends says, is cash in a can. Mm -hmm. And it is the way to give that fresh, clean foundation on which I hung generic art, right? And if I can jump in real quick and add one thing to that from the cleaner's perspective, we can clean your baseboards all day long. I know in the UK, they're called skirting boards. We can clean them all day long. But if you're going to paint that wall, go ahead and paint those baseboards at the same time. That is the little board that runs along the floor where the carpet meets the wall so that it tucks the carpet in underneath so you don't have loose carpet that peels up. And uh, it collects dust from everybody that walks in. So yes, if there's humidity, like in North Carolina where I live, that dust that settles there, if it's not dusted frequently, it can turn into kind of a darker color, like a little dirt that's stuck on there. Go ahead and paint all of that while you're painting the walls. So that'll really upgrade the, the look of your home. Right. And, and a freshly painted home speaks again to what we've all mentioned. It gives the feel of a well-maintained home. And that's really important for buyers. And I think that... Um, Regina was probably an issue that your client had today, just seeing a house that didn't look like it was well maintained. The thing that was sad is the house itself had been maintained pretty well. It was they needed a regular cleaner to come in or someone to come in because it was literally all of the things that, like Angela mentioned, that you get kind of blind to. You know, they had teenage kids and pets. And so every light switch, every handle, you know, the door jams, you just were like, didn't want yeah. to touch them. <laughs> where well, and, and it's, it's interesting so that I've, I've got a, I've got a home office in my house where we have uh, employees that come in and they sit there and there's one employee that always kicks the, the wall under the table. And so should I move the tables today and where are we going to sell the house? That whole wall has to be painted because of all the kick prints on the, on the wall. It's not a big deal. I don't mind it, but I'm not going to paint until we rearrange that that seating arrangement so that we we then can do it all at one time. But it's just it's the little things that you overlook because you see the house every day that if you will, what like Betsy's saying, if you will just go in and you'll touch it up, it's it doesn't mean you got to repaint the entire house. But there are little areas that need extra special attention because if a person walking in does not know, oh, there were a whole bunch of people that sat in here every day and they were kicking the walls with their foot. You're going to walk in, what you're going to say is, wow, this this place is all beat up, right? Little black marks all over the walls. What the heck, right? A little yeah. paint can cure that just like that. Yes. And while so, you're often like visually blind to the things, like Angela mentioned, you can also be nose blind. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So your house yes. itself, especially if you live in historic areas like I do, where the houses are old, they have their own unique musk. Right? <laughs> that you forget about after living there for so long. And I think it's really important. I'm very sensitive to smells. I hate the smells of fake deodorizers, Febreze. None of that works for me. I immediately start sneezing. But I got organic candles all in the same scent that wasn't too floral. I wanted to appeal to a lot of people. So I got like this cotton laundry scent uh, of organic, naturally scented candles. And I had one scent throughout the whole house. So it wasn't like they were experiencing different aromas in different rooms, which could potentially be overwhelming. But I wanted to mask any scent that I could no longer smell. That's a great tip. And it so many buyers come in and they have the same sensitivities. So not only can the overwhelming sense trigger something like, hmm, are they hiding something? But it is being it's being um, sensitive to what the, the people coming into your home, what may trigger their allergies. So that's a great tip. And, and if I can jump in again one more time, not to, to keep throwing cleaning at you, but I mean, hey, that's what I know, right? That's what you do. It's important. Um, 
a lot of home buyers and home sellers getting ready to buy a house, what they'll do is they'll try to clean between each showing. And so they're spraying stuff like Febreze and they're spraying cleaning chemicals and stuff like, oh, hey, this smells so clean. Let me just pour pine sol in the toilet and this and that and whatever. And they're trying to create these smells that then the house smells clean. I want to remind you guys that clean does not have a smell. And so if you keep masking it, the smells over and over and over again with cleaning supplies, it doesn't impress anybody like, oh, hey, the house is so clean because I keep smelling all these chemicals that, <laughs> that are supposed to be clean. Clean doesn't have a smell. And so if you will eliminate that and you will use non-toxic products with no scents, it's going to make it so much easier for if you're just like Betsy said, you've got one smell that goes throughout the whole entire house. Let that be the smell. Let that be the smell and don't try to compete because all these weird competing smells that people and house cleaners too have sensitivities, but a lot of homeowners just over the years from all the different products that are available, they've got the sensitivities too. And if they walk in a house and their eyes immediately turn red and their nose clogs up, they're like, Ugh. that's not a good user experience. It is not. Well, and another good uh with, with having the one scent throughout the house is it keeps the house subconsciously in your mind. If you have all these different scents, it's chopping the house up. Mm -hmm. And if you have one experience throughout the house, it creates a different experience for you, a better experience. And the other way to naturally alleviate some of that smell is to have a lot of plants. Now, plants mm -hmm. are natural air cleaners, but also they will sell your house. I do not have a green thumb. I cannot sustain plant life. Uh, typically, typically. And so my biggest plant investments would be at Trader Joe's, right? Something for four bucks. If it dies, I'm not devastated. I didn't get it at the local nursery and, you know, had a lot of maintenance. But when I was going to sell my house, my friend who's a stager gave me another piece of advice. She's like, Betsy, your house needs to look one plant shy of a jungle. She's like, you need tall, big plants, plants that I could keep alive only during the staging process. Then they immediately died. You need big plants and you need lots of little plants and every room must have plants. One plant shy of a jungle. I spent, I think, $300 in Trader Joe's plants. <clears throat> and then I spent $150 a piece on two large palms that died after three months. Um, and it was an amazing investment. Every That's a great tip. Beautiful plants, because if you do cut flowers, if you do fresh fruit, uh, it's going to die over the course of time. Mm -hmm. And depending on how long your house is on the market, hopefully just a short time like mine. But uh, that's a lot to keep replenishing and it gets expensive. Mm hmm. So I've what? got a question for the realtors in the room. Um, and this is something that it, what, what Betsy just triggered if you had to buy, because I know that in my kitchen, I've got this amazing, really tall palm. And I'm not like Betsy because I don't I don't have the the green thumb for even three months to keep a palm alive. So it's a fake plant, but it looks amazing. And I bought it, I think, at the home goods store where you, I spend a little fortune on it. And it's it's lived there for many years and it looks amazing. But it's one of those plants that it's kind of like it lives there. I don't know where else you would move it and you have to have a certain size room for it to fit in and all those things. What are the odds and does this ever happen where somebody who's coming through the house goes, hey, I want that plant left when I buy the house? Is there, does that ever happen or? Well, yes, I just yeah. sold a house and the seller was combining homes with her future husband she sold my client almost everything, including towels, bath, all the bath accessories, her bed, almost everything in the home. So, yeah, that happens a lot. Especially when a home is staged well. Mm -hmm. People walk in and they're like, oh, we love the lighting and the pictures and the mirrors. And they, when it's done right, people walk in and they, it's perfect. Like we, we, there's no way that we could stage it better than this. We want everything. Right. So then we get to negotiate all of those things. In. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then Betsy gets her money back. I got it. I see how that works. I don't even have to use my home goods receipt. Yeah. So Betsy, I have a question. You said with those beautiful throw pillows that your kids are the older, the what your originals, the kids toss them around. So how difficult did you find it to be? keeping your home looking staged and fresh in between showings with having an, an active family still living there? 
It was exhausting and difficult. Uh, and in between showings, I would put the good stuff away. So the good bedding, the good pillows, it all went in a closet and was not there during the time when my kids were there. We did not use the Williams and Nomi hand soap. Nope. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I wanted it to look full and abundant. Um, we did not drink any Pellegrinos. Uh, <laughs> if we ate the organic fruit, we replaced it. So it was really important that before, I mean, I only had two weekend showings, but before each one, everything was replenished. Everything was perfect. Wow. That's a lot. And it was a lot of upkeep, especially because we were doing it in the spring, which is during the school year. My kids at the time were nine and 10. And so there's backpacks, there's shoes, there's softball, right. there's mud, there's cleats. Uh, it was a heavy lift, especially if somebody wanted to last minute see it during the week. Like that mm. was no joke. My husband and I both worked from home uh, because by that time I'd given up my office space knowing that we were moving. It was horrible. We basically lived a nightmare <laughs> until we were under contract because you can still show, right? right? Even somebody's already got an accepted offer. So, uh, you know, our life was really put on hold for three months. But so worth it, wouldn't you say, with the return that you got? Completely. And also, yeah. we didn't miss any of the stuff we'd put in storage. We put half our stuff in storage and we thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to constantly be wanting X, Y, Z. I didn't even remember what was there till we moved to our new house and all these extra boxes showed up. And I was like, I don't want that stuff back. Right. We didn't miss it. I wasn't looking for it. What am I going to yeah. do with it? Moving yeah. and staging is a great time to um, to purge your life a little bit and get rid of some of those things that you don't need and are are cluttering your life. Angel, I know you can, you, you have clients that you work with who deal with those issues all the time. Well, one of the things that is really important when you are consciously aware that you're going to move, and it might even be like a year before you're going to move, that's when you want to start decluttering because like Betsy said, they didn't miss a lot of those things. How, how often are some of the things that we have in our homes used? And I think Betsy made a really great suggestion to get rid of half of the stuff that you own. Because if you started that process a year prior to when you get ready to move, you're not like, oh, we've got this whole storage unit full of stuff that you actually, like Betsy said, didn't miss at all. Did it actually need to go to a storage unit? And so a lot of people can get rid of a lot of stuff that then they don't have to pay to store. But second of all, when they're moving into a new space, what's interesting is this. Betsy set the stage for a beautiful home where when these people showed up, they look at this and they're like, oh, my goodness, I see myself in this haven right? It's not a place that's like crammed, packed with, with stuff. And so then what happens is they want to move into that place. By the time they bring all their stuff in, it doesn't look like that anymore. What if it did? What if when you move to the new space of your new home, you're only taking a fraction of your things? And that way you're not trying to find places to organize them and shove them and hide them behind closet doors and all that stuff. You're moving into a new place. You're actually starting over again. It's like wiping the slate clean and you get to start over again. And that becomes right. your new normal. And I love that because Betsy has already painted the picture. You live here now. This is your house. You deserve the fancy soaps. You deserve the fancy drinks. You deserve the fresh raw fruits. And by just buying into that lifestyle, you don't want to be bringing all your clutter and crap along with you, right? And so, yeah, it's a, it's a whole concept. Why did we not have this intervention before I moved into my new home? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because my new home was double the size and I found places for all that crap I didn't use or need. Yeah. Well, and you bring up a good space. You, you, a good question there, because just having space doesn't mean you need to fill it. Uh, mm -hmm. Betsy, you've got a fantastic podcast, and I hope you tell us about that. But on one of your podcasts I was listening to, you were explaining to a woman, and I guess you were doing an evaluation of her space. And she said, oh, I have this space. And there was like this little area behind a, a sofa. And she said, I, I should just put something there. And you're like, why? And she's like, because it, it's empty. And you're like, Why? Why, why do you have to fill it up? And she didn't have a good answer. And I loved your answer. You're like, it's okay to have empty space. <laughs> I was like, go yeah. Betsy, go Betsy. It's according to feng shui, which are time-tested rules for how things feel best. You know, that's where your good chi lives. It's where you allow people to visually breathe. And, you know, the difference between interior design and staging on a very fundamental level is when you're laying out a space, you need to make sure when you're staging that you have walkways open, that the tour that people would be taking with their real estate agent is open and clutter-free. 
Whereas as a designer, when I'm thinking about designing a space, I'm thinking I want to have seating opposite the sectional so they can talk. I want to make sure I have enough chairs around the table so we can fit grandma and grandpa and everybody. But oftentimes it's too much stuff for a nice tour around the home. So really eliminating even more stuff than you normally would in terms of furniture pieces, not just clutter, is a vital part of staging and thinking about what trajectory, what path do I want them to follow around my home that shows it the best versus how are they going to live here? Who cares how they're going to live here in terms of watching TV and sitting there and talking to their friend who comes over for cocktails? No. Uh, so that's another thing to think about. Yeah. Creating that good flow. That is so important. Yeah. And um, when you say you got, you eliminated about half of the things in your home, was a lot of that furniture or was a lot of it just your personal effects? Most of it was personal effects. We emptied half of the closet. We emptied half of the cupboards, you know, glasses and um, silverware. We got rid of half. Like I literally took everything and said, we're getting rid of half, half the pots and pans, half the plates. Like I wanted the cupboards to look relatively sparse. I didn't want them to look packed or else we're going right. to look like we have storage issues. Right. The other thing that I eliminated, which is going to be controversial, is I eliminated my pets. No, I didn't kill them. <laughs> we have a cat and a dog and I love them so much, but they were never around and there were no traces of them during the showings, which was exhausting. By the what way. did you do with them? Yeah. <laughs> Well, one went to grandma's house and one came. So the cat went to grandma's house because there's a litter box that can't move. You know, there's all these other accoutrements. But with the chihuahua, he could come with us and he would just drive around with us in the car during these showings. But there were no dog toys. There was no cat tree. There was no evidence that any pets lived in that home. And for me, and this may just be a personal pet peeve, but when I was looking at homes to buy, the minute I saw any kind of pet bed, any kind of doggy door, I was like, oh my gosh, who's been peeing on these floors? Right. I mean, I'm That's... a pet owner. I know what happens even with accidents. Who's been barfing on these countertops? I know, right? And it just made it feel less clean, even if there wasn't any indication that there had been a hairball there, mm -hmm. right? So um, it just put my spidey senses up and I immediately got the pets out every visit. Nobody would ever know. That's a great point. Um, I I had a home that when it's a luxury home, we were selling and the seller wanted to stay there with the aggressive dog in the home. I'm like, yeah, we can't do that. We, you're never going to sell your house if you stay there with the dog in your home. So th that's, a, that's a great tip. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, when you're, you said you you emptied your closets. So I'm imagining you were selling in the spring. So you put your winter things away, which is another great way to get ahead of a move. Is that what you did? You, you took the winter items out or the, the seasonal items that you weren't wearing? Half of like we were already rotating our seasonal, our closet space because we lived in a historic home. So our closets were already pretty small. And speaking of when you do have small closets, make sure to put a light in them. Having a light in them immediately looks makes them look bigger. Our home was built in 1910. It had very small closets and there were no lights in any of the closets. We installed that. So when you'd open it up, you'd immediately get a light, which will make it look <clears throat> fresher, brighter, bigger. And even some of our on-season clothes, because our closets were so small, had to go away. And no, we did not miss them. I never looked for that summer dress. I forgot it existed. Uh, so, you know, I'm actually, I mean, full disclosure, I don't even fold things that go in my drawers. I just kind of shove them sometimes. I do. <laughs> guys. This is a confessional, right? Uh, I made sure everything was folded. I assumed they were opening my underwear drawer. Is that wrong? Mm -hmm. You've got to assume that everything is going to be touched, opened, explored. And I want them to imagine that the person who lived here was fastidious on top of everything. This is who they're going to be when they live here, right? That aspirational avatar. Right. It puts them in the place of this is my fresh new start. I'm going to have this beautiful, wonderful life when I move into this home. I'm going to start doing that. And it's a great mm -hmm. mind space to put somebody in. And yes, mm -hmm. everybody opens the, all the drawers 
your they want to see the cabinets. depth and the size <laughs> or your stuff <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's a question for both the realtors and for Betsy, but what are some common mistakes that first time home sellers make when they don't know about the staging and they don't know about even the cleaning and they don't know what they're supposed to do? What are some common mistakes that you're seeing that would be just kind of good pointers or good tips for people that are like, oh, I didn't know about that? Well, I have a big one, uh, but Brooke, I don't want to cut you off. You want to go? No, no, no. Go ahead. You know, in interior design, we value window treatment so much. Beautiful drapes, having blinds as well is really important. But when you're staging your home, it can actually make your windows look smaller. It can encroach on the view. So either pull the blinds all the way up or get rid of the blinds completely to really make as much light able to come through those windows as possible potentially consider removing the curtains, which is something I would never do in a designed home. But we just want those windows to look so big. We want that natural light to flood in and we don't want anything to impede it. So like I mentioned earlier, sometimes the principles of interior design are counterintuitive when you're staging. And that's another one where get rid of your window treatments. Well, and what Betsy's not saying, and I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of people that don't understand how much dust is on those fabrics. And they're like, oh, they're beautiful and they match the room and whatever. And again, clutter blind or house blind, when you're not seeing that there's there's actually a lot of dust on those, if they're leaving the window treatments, we have to come in and include vacuuming those or treating them, dry cleaning them or whatever it is in order for those to be show ready if they're going to leave them on. And I love your idea about just removing them all together. So, yeah, most most buyers are moving because they want a fresh start, either a bigger place that their growing family can fill in um, or they're downsizing and they want to get rid of some things. So for the most part, people are looking for that fresh start. So making it feel open and big and clean and fresh is really fundamental and making your home put its best foot forward. And I think one of the mistakes I think I see people make is they over personalize and it hurts their soul to take those personal effects down. I hear sellers say, well, I still live here, but you need to get in the mindset of you don't live here anymore. This is a transition for you now and you need to be preparing for that next step. So take down those personal pictures um, or the, the trophies or the personal things that are for the buyer's perspective, it's just clutter. For you, it's personal. Go ahead, pack it up. You're going to be moving anyway. So give that, give your home a chance to stand out with the buyer. And especially with those personal items, it's really difficult for the, the buyers walking in to envision their home, their stuff there when they see such personal items mm -hmm. in the house. Like, mm -hmm have it be staged, have it be unpersonal. And I know it, it does sound counterintuitive, but people need to be able to envision their kids stuff up and their, their belongings in the house. And we had two large gallery walls, which is sort of a collection of a lot of pictures featuring our family in two different places, one upstairs and down. And I did not want to remove the gallery walls because we were going to have these huge walls that had nothing on them. I knew I'd have to buy some big art. And then also I just didn't want to patch all those holes and go to all the mess. So what I did is I replaced the personalized pictures in the frames with pictures of our new air er of our area. So we lived in um, the Hudson River Valley and the river towns gorgeous views of the Palisades, beautiful views of the Hudson River. So I went to Barnes and Noble. I got a book on the area. I ripped out the pages and I put the best ones, the seasonal ones, so that they would, I knew they'd be moving from somewhere else because we're a suburban destination, right? I knew they'd be moving from the city, most likely my avatar, remember? And so I wanted to show them what this area would offer their family. Like look at the fall foliage over the Palisades as you gaze right. upon it from the Hudson River, which we could clearly see from our balcony, right? I wanted to show them that this leap from city living to suburbia is going to be gorgeous. And it truly is out there if you've ever been to the Hudson River Valley. Um, but it was a great opportunity for me to kind of paint the picture for them of what this move will mean. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. that is a, that's yeah. a great idea. Great idea. Saved you a lot of, yeah, and it saved you so much work. Yeah. 
I popped them in the same pictures, put the pictures back on the same nail. And then I used that coffee table book on the coffee table, right? If, hopefully they didn't open it up because they'd be seeing lots of, <laughs> <laughs> but it was stacked among lots of other books. And I'm Don't guessing you didn't book return back. that book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna, <laughs> that's a sunk cost right there. <laughs> But what a great idea. I love that. Yeah. I'm stealing that. What are some uh, some trends that you're seeing right now? I know that every few years there's like a rotation of like it's cool to have like a certain color of cabinets or a certain type of backsplash or something like that. What are the trends that you're seeing right now that um, buyers need to be aware of or sellers need to be aware of? Yeah. Well, one thing is I hate trends. Sorry, Angela, I hate trends. Uh, I like a little bit of trendiness in a staged home because it makes it look of the moment. And again, aspirational, but I would do it in like a poof that has an interesting texture. I would do it in some wall art. I would not do it in anything like a backsplash or cabinets because it truly will be just a flash in the pan. And these items need to stand the test of time. Also doing something so committal like kitchen cabinets or a backsplash is going to um, really impact the sale price, right? So you want to do something classic and clean if you're going to be changing those versus leaning into a trend. One trend right now is colorful cabinets, especially navy or emerald green. And while I love that look for sale, I think it's super controversial and I'm not sure that you would reap the rewards financially. But like I did go to Home Goods and bought this really woven poof with some tassels, something that was really of the moment last summer, something I wouldn't um, think about as timeless. But having those little baubles, kind of like wearing that classic black dress that's so sophisticated and clean, and then adding those little, um, you know, J. Crew or Express baubles that are really of the moment. I think that's the best way to think about staging. Right. Accessorize and bring your trends in through your accessories, but the big picture should be classic and timeless. So I don't really follow trends as a designer. I know, isn't that silly? But I think about what fits the client and what fits their budget and what fits the architecture. And then, of course, what's available retail. And that's often following trends. But when you're shopping in a place like TJ Maxx or Home Goods for your staging supplies, you're going to find a ton of trends. So you're going to be picking up that room jewelry that's got a lot of flair because they're just based on trends and cycling out home trends um, on the regular. That's kind of where it all lands. Well, let me ask you a question, Betsy, because you've given us some really helpful tips. And I'm curious to know if there's somebody and they're like, I am totally not creative. I don't know staging. I don't know home designing. I don't have an eye for it. I don't know what center and off center means. <laughs> how, do, how does somebody go about hiring you to come in and help them fix their space and get it ready to sell? How does that work? So there's a few different ways. You know, you can have us consult, which means we'll come to the space. We'll give you ideas on how to rearrange your current furniture, what pieces you need to buy, where they should go, how big they should be, kind of giving you that punch list. And then you go make it happen, which is truly the affordable way to do things. But it is a lot of elbow grease. I mean, I literally devoted so much time that I was taking away from work to make this happen. And it was not fun. It was not easy. When you're doing it for somebody else, the emotional component is not there. And you can lean in to the fun of transforming a space and making it so aspirational and different than it's ever been. When it's your space, there's a lot on the line. When it's your money, there's just a lot of emotion wrapped in. So I do think it's better if you can to hire somebody to implement all those changes, to not just get that honeydew list, but to have that honey done space, right? Where you hire the interior designer who has the appropriate handyman, who has the appropriate painter. So it's an all in one solution. Now it is more expensive and the price is truly customized to the square footage of the space and what the space will need. But I tell you what, it makes a huge difference. I'm so glad that we painted inside and out and I didn't do any of it, right? Like I hired my team that I work with. I hired my handyman. I was the one shopping. I was the one styling. I was the one creating the ideas. 
but my team was the one who was actually doing that intensive labor. And if you don't have a team, you know, pay an expert to bring their experts. And that's, I'm so glad you brought that up because I know that um, I removed several paintings on my wall and I was just going to spackle over the, the, the nail pops or whatever, but we had screwed those things in the wall so that they expand. And then when we pulled them out, there were like holes in the wall. <laughs> so then I had to patch the walls and then sand them down and put the spackling on them and then paint them. And I was thinking, oh, this is going to take me 20 minutes to do. It did not. It took me like hours before yeah. the wall looked like it was brand new again. I'm like, wait a minute. Why did I do that? This is not what I do. Why, why did I just do that? And in my head, it was like this really short little, oh, it'll just take a couple minutes. Uh, it did not. And I think people underestimate what it actually is involved in those little tiny, oh, it'll just take a couple minute projects. Definitely. You know, I don't do my own taxes. I outsource as much as I can where I'm not the expert because it just, you'll get a better result. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And it's your biggest investment. Your home is your biggest investment. So you want to treat it with care. And if you're going to be selling your home, you want to get the most from that investment that you possibly can. So have the repairs done by professionals. Um, I'm sure there's some small things you can do, but the bigger things you want to make sure that they're done well. Absolutely. And there's so many and big area where I'm in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So there are, it's so easy now to find um, well-rated professionals to, to handle those projects for you. Definitely. Uh, so at any level, whether you just need advice, you know, and you can listen to a lot of podcasts like this one, or whether you need a little bit of handholding, like those consults with a stager. So my company, Uploft Interior Design, is not the only one that does those consults. So in your area, you can find someone. And then, of course, you can do that more robust package. But there are so many opportunities these days. There's interior design is, you know, having a big moment. Uh, so you'll be able to find someone and it will be worth it. It. Like I said, we bought the place for a little under a million. Um, and six years later, we sold it for 1.5. We were able to buy a 2.1 and have our payments be the exact same because we made so much from the sale of the home. And so now we're living on 15 acres from 0.13. Wow. Yeah, now I have a 4,400 square foot home with a separate cottage in the back where I'm broadcasting from today versus 2,300 square feet, you know. Uh, so it's a totally different lifestyle, but we really were able to up level and kind of play that real estate game and mm -hmm. win. And I think a huge part of it was the staging effort. Absolutely. So what advice would you give to somebody that has never sold a home and has never staged before and doesn't know where to start? Because they always ask us like, hey, um, can, can you come to a clean? And we're like, uh, no, you're not ready for us yet. And there's a stage of getting rid of half your stuff. And then there's a stage of deciding what you're going to keep. And then, of course, making sure everything is clean so that when you put that stuff back or you stage it and it's where it's supposed to go, that you're not then pulling stuff out, and trying to move stuff so you can clean the baseboards behind it or the walls behind it or any of those things. What would you give? What advice would you give to somebody that like has no idea where to start? Personally, I would say find an amazing real estate agent. That should be your first step. Let them know you're thinking about putting this on the market. Find out what they think you could get for it realistically, because that will give you your budget, right? One to 5% mm -hmm. of the sale price will give you your budget on how much you should be spending. And then make sure you save that amount so you are able to invest. But the other thing is your real estate agent will know what's happening in the moment, right? Should I put up a wall and make this large room, two rooms, or is open concept still in? Are there changes that I need to make that are bigger than I think that will take more time than I think? So when you have that inkling, Angela, just like you said earlier, when you start to purge, when you start to downsize a little bit in terms of getting rid of stuff you don't use, you can also have consulted with that real estate agent and say, oh, I need to do something with the backsplash. Or, you know, I do need to change the tile around the shower. It's not salvageable. And so these larger projects you can budget for as well as looking and creating a plan for staging. Because you can't, as we mentioned earlier, living in a staged place is not sustainable. It is so hard to yell at your kids constantly, do not touch that, do not drink that. <laughs> what are you doing? And plus, it's really, 
you know, Brooke mentioned earlier that it's so disappointing to remove your personalized effects. And as an adult, I could get past that. I realized I was in a transitional space, but having my son peel his name off the wall with the decals hurt him inside. Yeah. You know, taking down his trophies and hiding the Pokemon cards made him feel really bad. Yeah. And it was not a helpful part of the process when we were trying to get him to move from his only hometown he's ever known. Right. Right. So you want to make that process as short as possible. So the more you can plan ahead and say, we're just going to do that right before we sell, the more you can kind of protect everyone's sanity um, and just kind of have a plan. Emotionally prepare. That's yeah. Right. And everybody needs a different level of emotional preparedness. My husband is a hoarder. Um, he's not going to listen to this, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, my husband is a hoarder. And so he had a huge attachment to that half of the stuff that we were going to take away. It became a very big emotional lift for us yeah. to put this stuff in boxes. Um, whereas for me, it would just be an afternoon shove it in, tape it up. And he's like, I need to look through everything. I need to say goodbye, uh, you know, even for a short time. So think about people's emotional journeys. When well, and so piggyback on, onto that, Betsy, um, you, that's a great first is to get a real estate agent because that real estate agent can take away some of the emotion to that conversation you're going to have with your husband about going through things will land differently from a real estate agent mm -hmm. than a spouse. And your real estate agent should have a list of professionals that can help you with those things. If you really are in a situation where you need a professional organizer, your real estate agent can help with that or a painter. They can help with that or a deep clean. They can help with that. So I and love Brooke, that Brooke, while we've got you on the line, I'm, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I just got my copy of Brooke's new book, the ultimate guide Woo! to first time home buyers. Woo -hoo! Yes, 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 yes. Brooke, Brooke, tell us about your book. And then I want to hear about Betsy's podcast, because I know that we've got, we've just got some amazing people here on the call that have done some amazing stuff, but Brooke, tell us about your book. Cause I know that you've been working on that and that's, this is amazing stuff that you're, you're sharing with us right now. Yeah, I have been working on it. My passion is working with first time home buyers. I really love um, educating them through the process, guiding them through it. I remember being a first time home buyer and being so scared to even check my credit or how am I going to come up with the down payment, all of those sorts of things. So I really um, felt the call to put this book into place to help first time home buyers see that it, it's a step-by-step -step process. It doesn't need to be overwhelming. And it's your first step into the, your dream home. And like Betsy said, this house, you're going to be able to level up one day and be homeowner for the rest of your life. It's a great journey. And I just wanted to help folks along with that. So hopefully some first time home buyers out there will, out there will find that helpful and you can find it on Amazon. It's in Kindle or paperback version. And there's some good um, questions in there to ask your realtor, your lender when you're starting in the home buying process. So hopefully it'll help some people out there become homeowners. Yay. The American dream. So thank you for bringing that up. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank All you right, so, so much. As these first time home buyers and home sellers are getting ready, Betsy, tell us about your podcast and all the amazing things that somebody's going to learn, like the things that we've learned with you today. Tell us about that. Well, first of all, can I ask you guys to bundle those books together? I think they really go hand in hand, like the deep clean move in, move out checklist with the first time home buyer. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's just a bundle together in a basket. Great idea. Yeah. So I see a collab there. Um, and then, of course, they could get my book, Affordable Interior Design. Yay! Yes. Those would be great gifts for do you. Buyers. Do you have that with you? Hold on one sec. Show us do what I, that looks Do like. I ever? Do <laughs> you ever? Yeah, that is a great gift for, uh, for clients. Affordable um, speak, Home Design. Speaking of books, Regina, you have a book that's coming out. While Betsy's getting her book, tell us really quickly about your book that's just on the cusp of coming out. Uh, it's Realtors in Transition. So we're, we've got a lot of realtors in this economy that are, are going in a different direction. And so my book is How to Help Them Transition. I, I can't love wait for that. that. I, I love that. that. I know there's a lot of time management. Bundle. That goes in a different bundle, Regina, but I, I think, think that's so, yeah, that is so good too. That is oh, that's awesome. Beautiful. 
Let's all see right. it again. I didn't, I didn't get to see the Let's cover. see your book, Betsy. I want to see all about this. Oh, nice. Oh, it's fine. High-end tips for any budget. And it really has so many truly usable tips, like DIY checklists. Um, my favorite section is the end, where we have the naughty words list, things you should never have in any home. Uh, <laughs> so there's a checklist for you. Can I, uh, can I leave links in the notes below so that people can get a copy of that book? Because right now, if, if everybody's like me, they're asking the questions, what are the naughty words? And we don't have time today, but I'm, <laughs> I, I, I want them to buy your book and read what those words are. These are the things we don't want, we don't want in a home. Yeah. Never, never do these things. My naughty word checklist. Oh, I love, I love it. I, I love, love it. it. They are. I want to know what all of them are. They're good. They're good. And believe me, you're probably, well, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys are not violating any of them. But uh, if, if you do see something that looks familiar, please take it down, remove it, donate it. You know, <laughs> there you go. All right. We got to run around the room real quick. Everybody tell us where people can go to find you. Tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you're working on or what have you. And then we'll, we, we got to scoot. Regina, we'll start with you and we'll go around the room. Uh, Regina Brown, uh, realtor here in San Antonio. You can find me at Regina B Realty on every social platform. So if you need help buying or selling a home, I'm here. I would love to help you. Great. Brooke? I'm, uh, you can find me at Ask Brooke Bryan on all the social medias, and you can find uh, the Ultimate Guide for First-Time Home Buyers on Amazon. And I've had so much fun today. I've learned so much. I'm stealing some ideas um, from, from you, Betsy. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yes. And if you have more questions, if you need more ideas, I have a podcast called Affordable Interior Design. People write in with their design dilemmas, whether they're staging a home or decorating their current space and they're a little bit stuck. As Angela mentioned earlier, they can send in pictures and I'll solve their issues for free on the show. Wow. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of tips and a lot of fun scenarios that we hear about from all over the world. And, uh, and we answer them live on the air. Yay. Love it. You guys, this was so awesome. And I'm Angela Brown. You can find me on all the social medias at Ask Angela Brown. And I am the host of the Ask a House Cleaner podcast and also the Clutter Corner podcast, where we help people that are dealing with clutter and hoarding issues since the pandemic. And it's all those people that are scared to get rid of that other half of stuff that Betsy had the guts to get rid of and hide before they put their house on the market. So this was awesome. You guys, thanks so much for joining us. I'll turn this back over to Regina as she wraps us up for the day. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It was great having you all. We look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care.